Hello. Well, I've bought a new video recorder. I think Mrs. Video 99's got that for me. <coughs> oh dear. Uh, and I think it might have come with a camcorder as well. <coughs> Sorry. Well, it comes in this Pelican 1500 case. It's um, pretty substantial. But what kind of video recorder could fit in here? The answer would seem to be a small one. So we have some firewire cables. So that might be a clue the kind of video recorder we're looking at in here. And a user manual on CD. A power adapter from UK to USA, so that's selling us something. So, mains adapter with an American plug on it, but since it takes a figure of eight power cable, we don't need to use any of that nonsense. We can just use a normal UK figure of eight input. And this is... 100 to 240 volts, so that'll plug into UK mains just fine, even though this is clearly intended for the USA market. And what we have is this charming little HDV deck. Now I already have an HDV deck, uh, and I already have a DV cam deck with a display, and I thought this machine might be a perfect combination of both because it's an HDV deck with a display. So uh, let's have a bit of a play with this and uh, see what's uh, good and bad about it. So first thing we need to do is switch it on. It's plugged in um, through a power supply, which is like a camcorder power supply. I'll show you the rear panel later. So most devices, you've got a sort of soft switch on off, but this has actually got a, a click on, click off switch. So the uh, remote it comes with doesn't have a power switch. I've been experimenting with this. This is a remote from a different uh, HDV deck and it's got more functionality than this. So the, re the remote that comes with it, you can't get to the menu screens on the remote. This remote, which is used for a different HDV deck, you can. So for example, I can clear this, let's set the clock thing on here. Uh, but it does have a power switch on this, power button, but this machine ignores it because it's got a physical power switch. Let's try the eject button as well. All right, that doesn't work either because the eject on this is inside. There's a button there, you can't quite see. I'll set it up so you can. There's the eject button. Then we come to this extremely strange mechanism. This mechanism feels like a camcorder. Let's press eject. That's the camcorder deck. And of course now we spot the immediate big problem with this. Because my big DV cam decks and HDV decks take small high definition and standard definition tapes. But also the large ones. <laughs> That's not going to work. So you could buy this without paying attention to what you're doing. I think you're buying something that's capable of playing DV cam tapes, especially since on the front panel it does actually list DV cam, but really it's only mini DV cam. It doesn't take full size DV cam tapes, which many, many DV cam recordings are. So this thing could really catch you out. Oh well, anyhow, let's open it and pop in a high definition recording. And we can play that. So that's an HDV 1080i recording. Uh, it, this one doesn't do 1080p as one of my other HDV decks does. Uh, that was an expensive add-on feature uh, that was only put on towards the end of the life, I think, of HDV format. I don't know whether it will play the JVC 720p tapes. Um, 
if it does, it'll probably just display it in standard definition. It won't be able to output it um, through the firewire port. But uh, that's working. Um, let's do a few little experiments. One thing I'd like to do is show you if I do... Oh, there's no batteries in the original remote. Let's use this alternative one. If I do rewind, and when it's rewinding, I press rewind again, it drops into what's often known as peep search. Well, it means it drops into picture search, and you let go, and it's instantly back into rewind. And this is a feature which is available on nearly all mini DV and video 8 decks, but not quite all. And many uh, Sony Betamax video recorders, which introduced the, the idea in the first place, and it's called Beta Skip Scan on those. And it's only available for formats that are fully laced. Now, as I've pointed out just now, this has got the menu button on it, and we can go through some of the menus, but this doesn't, so it begs the question, well, how with the original remote do you get to these? And the answer is there's another pop-down panel in there. And this has menu. So you can go through the various options, but only from the front panel, not from the original remote, which seems like an oversight, especially since they'd included the the codes anyway because it picks up these codes and works with them. So it's a very strange thing to have uh, missed those buttons out. I almost wonder if we took this apart whether there would be lands for extra buttons. Do you know I might do that? If this comes apart easily I'll have a look and see if it could actually be upgraded. Sometimes you can add extra buttons to a remote control. We'll look at that later. Right, we'll uh, do a standard definition tape in here now. So this should now drop to Demonstrate uh, the display that it's a standard definition. Look, DVSP50i. And SP, I suspect, because this machine supports DV cam, I would very much doubt that it plays long play recordings. We'll have a look in the service in the instruction manual. But generally, something that uh, can support DV cam can't support long play uh, if it can record on DV cam. Most Sony camcorders will play mini DV cam tapes, uh, but this can record in DV cam mode, so I think that means the heads will not be capable of doing long play record uh, playback. Again, we'll do peep search, so rewind, press the button again, and you can see what's going on during the rewind. Wait a second. One of the things I'd like to look at is the head hours, which most professional equipment does record. Uh, so let's see if that's available here. Oh, there we go, hours meter. So it's been running for 460 hours, drum run for only 140 hours. So it's all but a brand new machine, really. Tape run, 130 hours, and it's loaded about 370 tapes. So. It's just barely run in. It's basically brand new. One more quick demonstration of uh, HDV. One of the things about HDV is that they did recommend you use proper HDV tapes. And the reason I believe for that is that they have a, they're designed for very low dropout. If you have a dropout, uh, a very small dropout on a mini DV tape, mini DV standard definition recording, you might lose a frame or two and you'll barely notice it. But with HDV, there were special frames that come along every so often. Uh, so I think they're called GOP frames. So if you have a, a corrupted bit of tape, you can very often lose enough of the recording at playback time, perhaps a quarter of a second or half a second, where the image freezes. And you can really see that. So on high definition recordings, uh, tape condition is everything. And it's one reason, I think, really, that the HDV format was never robust enough. You can, under these various menus, um, tell it to down-convert from HD uh, to standard definition. Uh, you can also do so for the component outputs at the back. The record mode can be DV cam or HDV. And uh, here we can tell it to, in playback mode, either force always HDV or force always DV or uh, do automatic 
And the reason that can be useful is if you're, uh, you plug this into a computer and you're going to be playing, say, you're now going to be playing an HDV tape, it's, I find, easier to force it to HDV and then plug it into the computer and it will report itself as an HDV deck to the computer, which will then set itself up to, on the video capture software such as Pinnacle Studio and others, it'll be prepared for uh, HDV recordings. If you set it to auto, I found it can be a little bit difficult to get the, the capture process to, to work seamlessly. So that, that is useful at capture time. Changes not allowed, unplug iLink cable. Oh, I think what it's saying there is you need to have the uh, firewire cable unplugged when you change this. Well, okay, yes, because what I was just saying, I think if this changes while the firewire cable is plugged in, the unit at the other end may just get confused. So, yes, uh, either unplug the firewire cable or um, force it and then power it up. Okay, every time I switch this on, it's asking for me to set the clock and the clock is uh, assuming it's a 2005 which dates the machine let's see if when I set that it'll retain time and date information or if it'll uh, forget it when it's uh, unplugged it may need a battery in the back to uh, retain time or it may have uh, a rechargeable battery or, or a coin cell deep inside somewhere so I've set the clock let's see what happens to switch it off and on again. I trust it will have the clock set. Well, it didn't ask me to set the clock, but what happens if I take the power off at the switch? And now switch it back on. It seems to have some battery backup on the time anyway. Let's look around the back. So it takes a, a fairly standard Sony camcorder power supply, one of these, which means that uh, it'll run on anything from 110 to 240 volts. I took this little thing out earlier and I wished I hadn't. Uh, I think it's something for upgrading the firmware. You can put a battery in the back here. Um, I'm not sure I have a battery of the correct size though, but uh, you can put battery in there. Um, so you can run this as a field recorder. Now we've got composite and S-video in and out for standard definition. Um, high definition and standard definition uh, component out. But the most important connector of course is the DV connector and this can output DV or HDV uh, data streams for computer or connecting to another recorder. Uh, and the LANC remote control and you may have seen one of my other videos I did some experiments with a special remote control where you can actually access the internal registers in here and reprogram things but you could also completely screw up your machine so with great care. Now there's a firewire cable and I will be testing this on a computer later. It's of course extremely important that the firewire link works and it's only too easy to blow it up because this design of the large firewire plug is not very good. If it's a bit worn, it's possible to fit it the wrong way around. And if you do that, whether or not the device at the other end is powered up, it will fry the firewire port. They don't call it firewire for nothing. We were going to have a quick look in here to see if there's any lands on the remote control that would allow us to upgrade it to have these uh, menu buttons. In here we just see a capacitor which is probably against across the battery and a uh, ceramic resonator. At the back. Aha! Uh -huh. And then one chip and all these LANs for these missing functions. So I'll bet we can get to the menus by just putting some pads on those. Let's demonstrate that. Look! There's even slots here. You really, all they needed to do was cut out there and finish these rubber front pieces and you'd have access to all these extra buttons. Why did they deliberately take away that functionality? 
you do wonder what's going through their heads here, that they've gone out the way to take away functionality from this remote control. So let's demonstrate we can do that. On this we can hit menu and we can get into the menu. One of these LANs will operate the menu function, for sure. Okay, there are no LANs. Let's get this up. There are no available LANs under these, but all these other buttons have LANs under them. So let's press them and see if we can get into the menu mode. Or I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll use this remote control to get into menu and then see if it steps through or anything changes at all. Well, it doesn't look like the codes for the menus are in there at all. Do any of these buttons do anything? Nothing I can see. However, if I point this remote control at you, we press a, a real button, I'll press stop, you should see the LED flashing. Just about. Yes, I think we can see they're sending out some codes we don't know what they do. No, well, my idea of uh, adding extra pads to do things does not appear to work because though it's sending out some codes, they don't do anything. You notice one thing we lack here is any audio output. Uh, you'd have expected possibly, as is a picture, that there might be a, a control somewhere to allow us to have a little bit of audio output like you do on a camcorder, but there's no speaker built in. Right, let's reassemble this remote. Now what do we have in this other box? Well, it's certainly wrapped up well. Another USA power cable, so that tells us what we need to know about the uh, localization. Uh, these are just composite video. Again, one of the adapters. And we have a Sony Mini DV camcorder model DCR TRV18. This comes with a remote control, but I can't see that that would work the HDV deck. What I do like about the Sony power supplies is they're all multi voltage, so 100 to 240. So that all you need to do is change the uh, figure eight cable, some lenses, wide angle lenses, I suspect. Oh, well, actually, you're a Sony camcorder. Um, will you fit? No, not by a long way. Maybe battery. Large battery. That weighs much more than the camcorder, I think. A smaller battery. I wonder if that'll fit the HDV deck. No, I don't think so. That takes uh, a longer battery. Now, it does say NTSC on here. The thing is, with... Nearly all PAL Sony camcorders, they would also play NTSC tapes. Not quite all, I've found one or two that don't, but most do. However, I think it's extremely unlikely that this NTSC camcorder will play a PAL tape, but we could try it. The screen's quite small, isn't it? Let's power this thing up. Do VCR mode. That's where the connectors go, including Firewire. S-Video, AV, 
headphones, mic, lank. So it's a bottom feeder. I don't particularly like bottom feeder camcorders. It's uh, hard to work with. You know, some uh, later camcorders from Sony could detect when an HDV recording was loaded into them, even though they couldn't play it, they would say they couldn't play it. Uh, I don't think this would have that intelligence. I don't think it'll even have the intelligence to play a PAL tape, but let's see what happens. Okay, so it can play PAL tapes too. The remote isn't working, presumably it needs a new battery, yes. Uh, I just went to rewind and it sounds horrible. What's fast forward like? Fine. So if that was a Sony EVS 9000 Hi8 deck, I would say that if it's a rewind that's clonking, that the supply spool is split and the gear that's driving the spool is hitting a break in the teeth and making an awful noise. So what do you reckon is the likelihood is exactly the same problem with this? Let's have a look at the, uh, the deck. So the supply spool is over here on the left hand side. Let's uh, have a close look at that. So if you look at the uh, supply spool on this camcorder, you can see that there's a split in it right here. And this is unfortunately quite a common problem with some Sony uh, mechanisms that they uh, make a, a metal disc and then um, put a plastic surround on it, which has the, the teeth. And what will happen over time is the plastic will shrink, but the metal, of course, won't. And so the plastic splits. So uh, you get this gap where the teeth should be and the driving gear will make a clattering noise as it goes over that gap in the teeth. There was a very sophisticated machine, uh, a Hi8 one called the EVS 9000E, and there was an EVS 7000 in the USA, which was known for this problem. And unfortunately, uh, there were no more uh, new supply and take-up spools available to buy from Sony, so it means you have to try to repair them, which is nigh impossible. Now let me show you why this uh, actually is a write-off. This is a diagram showing a typical Sony Mini DV uh, camcorder mechanism. So you have the supply spool here, and it's of course in here we have the, the brake. Uh, and then the tape goes through a roller, then some guides around the spinning video head, uh, there's uh, another guide and roller, then quite crucially here you have the capstan, which is like a small metal pin that drives the pinch roller, which is a rubber roller, another guide, and then into the take-up. Now a lot of people don't realise that uh, this sort of basic layout is typical of nearly all video recorders, and people assume that the reels turning is actually what, what drives the tape, and it's not the pinch roller drives the tape, so this rotates that way and draws tape through the path. And all the supply spool and take-up spool have to do is give and take up the tape as it comes through the pinch roller. Now the important thing to note about um, Mini DV and Video 8 mechanisms, or most of them, is that they, will, they remain in this laced up condition at all times, including fast forward and rewind. So you can see, with the mechanism being permanently laced, how it's fairly easy for it to jump into picture search mode when it's in fast forward or rewind. All it has to do is change the speed of the tape possibly and set up the uh, servos to uh, give you a stable picture. Uh, and that wouldn't be possible if the tape was fully unlaced or partly unlaced because it'd take some time for the mechanism to move the tape back around the heads. So peep search allows us to almost instantly jump into picture search while the tape is uh, traveling at fast forward or rewind speed. And that's not possible on formats that unlace like VHS and they can kind of sort of um, emulate it a little bit. Some Panasonic decks do. So if you do the same thing, uh, Panasonic, some VHS decks 
will jump into picture search during fast forward, but they can't do it seamlessly because they have to go from semi-laced to fully laced. These, these guides here go through this, these slots when it goes from the unlaced position to the laced position. Uh, many beta machines can do it, and it was called beta skip scan on Sony machines. Sanyo generally, as far as I'm aware, no Sanyo machines can do it. But nearly all mini DV camcorders can. I've seen the odd one that doesn't support it, but nearly all do. And this is important because it means that the tape is fully laced just as though it's in play or, fast, or picture search during fast forward and rewind. That's one of the reasons, actually, that mini DV camcorders aren't particularly fast at rewinding a tape when you've finished, because the speed is limited by putting the tape through the tape path. And they, they don't have uh, the... They would be more complex. The, the mechanism would be more complex if you were to unlace and rewind in an unlaced position. And also you'd have no tape counter. You'd not know where you are on the tape. Now the reason I'm on about this is that if you remember then that uh, a machine is fully laced at all times, imagine a scenario that you're in rewind and you have a broken gear here. Now what's going on is there's a what is effectively a real idler. They'll give it some different names. Sometimes they call it pendulum or transfer gear or things. But it is a, a real idler. And this swings from side to side, depending if you're in play, fast forward or rewind. And there's a gear here that drives that one. It's called a transfer gear. And there's a friction mechanism here, which causes it to first slide from one side to the other uh, during uh, the drive operation for the reels. So we're considering rewind, so it needs to swing to the left for this spool to be driven in that direction. But suppose the gear here, one of the teeth, hits this brake during rewind. And it hits it so hard that instead of just making a horrible thumping noise, it stalls. Because this gap becomes too big for these teeth to jump between and it stalls. But the rest of the mechanism will continue in the rewind mode. That's to say, the pinch roller will be running in reverse during rewind because it's like, effectively, it's a reverse picture search. So the tape is being drawn by the pinch roller, not the spools in this case. Something like a, a basic VHS or Betamax deck. You know, the, the reels do the tape driving during fast forward and rewind, but not on here. The tape is drawn through by the pinch roller and capstan. So if this spool is not able to take up the tape as it comes off the deck, then it will pile up. Now the machine will realise something's wrong pretty quickly, probably within half a second or so. It'll stop with an error message because it'll realise that this is not rotating. There'll be a sensor under here. Uh, opto sensor or hall effect sensor, it will know that this is not spinning. But this will continue to feed tape out here, but the pinch roller will draw tape away from here. So now you'll have a pile of tape sitting in the deck. Now what's going to happen? Well it's probably gone to an alarm mode or something, and you'll probably hit eject you may have to power cycle the machine and eject. And very often the way these machines work is to draw the tape out from the deck as it unlaces. It drives the left-hand spool. They could drive either, but they'll typically drive the left-hand spool. And so, of course, now you've, it's still stuck probably on here. It won't be able to get the tape out. And you'll have all kinds of alarm messages going off and the tape will droop onto the deck probably and there is uh, a certain amount of grease here which allow these um, loading arms to slide along these slots and the tape is likely to hit the grease and collect some. So even if you manage eventually to get the tape out in some state it'll likely be damaged 
and it will likely have picked up some grease from the deck. It's seriously bad news because even if you have another machine, you put that tape into another machine and it's got grease on it. That grease is going to go straight onto the head drum. The machine will stop. The drum won't be able to spin because the grease will catch the drum. You'll finish up with contamination on the heads. The heads will almost certainly clog and you'll now have grease on the upper and lower drum potentially of the good deck and it gets worse. Even if you take that tape out and realise you're in trouble with that tape and put a good tape in your good machine, it's now got grease on the drum. That grease will probably get onto the tape and you can get this situation where the heads and the tape contaminate themselves for quite some time and you keep on ruining tapes, potentially making uh, messing up your machine as well and certainly fouling the heads. So it's seriously bad news. So the safest thing to do, unfortunately, if you have a situation where even the supply, the, 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 the supply spool here has got a, a split in it like that, there's always a risk you're going to hit rewind one day on that machine. You'll forget that that's a machine you mustn't hit rewind on. There's always a risk that you're going to get destroy a tape and get contamination on tapes and possibly on other machines. Now, of course, if there's a split in the take-up spool, things could even be worse because during play or fast-forward, it's going to stop and it'll carry on for a moment pulling tape out of here and you're going to have a similar sort of situation where you've got tape spilling out here. Similar sort of problems. So, uh, of course, in that case, you can't avoid, you know, you can't use a machine at all. If you've, if you've got a damaged take-up spool, you're going to be hitting that break in it in fast-forward and play. Well, you could argue that if you never rewind a tape, it would be safe to use it uh, with a broken supply spool, but really no, it's dangerous. So that's why this camcorder is unfortunately a write-off. But uh, at least we've found out uh, and, and learned something along the way. One last thing I wanted to mention was, remember I was saying earlier, this is the firewire cable from the HDV deck, and if you plug it in upside down on a worn socket, you can blow things up. It's best to avoid having to plug these in at all. So there's these things, there's two variations here. I'll show you this one. So you've got eight inputs and eight outputs. You could plug, say, HDV deck into there and maybe, oh, I don't know, a Digital 8 into there and a Canopus ADVC 55 into there and a DV cam and various other devices into these. And you can connect any one to any other. Now, in my particular case, I'm only really interested in one output. So I'll use number eight always as the output and then select up to seven input devices. Saves plugging and unplugging all the cables. Now, they are only passive, so it's not ideal in terms of signal integrity. And very occasionally, I've had a machine drop out during a transfer because it doesn't like the signal, the, the, the length of the cable and the switching inside here. But it's pretty rare and it's only on certain machines and sometimes it can be worked around by just using very high quality cables. So, yeah, they could have been designed a little bit better, but never mind. And personally, I would have rather that this had been um, eight in and one out rather than this rather complex crisscross design. This has a different design. It's four in and four out. So we've got in and out separated here. So this would only really give me four devices to one computer, whereas this gives me seven to one computer, because I don't want to connect multiple computers to this, personally. Would you like to see what's inside one of these? Um, by the way, these can fetch good money on eBay. Um, I've seen them sell for a lot, but I picked this one up on eBay the other day for about eight pounds, so I got scored a bargain there. Uh, let's have a quick look inside, shall we? So it's built on two PCBs for the switches, and there's an interconnect there. It looks, yeah, it's pretty high quality, isn't it? It's pretty well built piece of equipment. And considering it was a fairly low volume, it must have been a fairly expensive thing to, to make. I don't know how much they cost new, but it couldn't have been cheap. I'm guessing that this one's all built on one PCB, so it's probably a lot cheaper. 
So correct, that's all built on one PCB, uh, a much simpler design. Um, but that only gives me four inputs, whereas the other one gives me effectively seven. So there they are, the Kramer uh, Firewire switches. I just wish they had active electronics in them uh, and then it could be even more reliable. Well, we've covered quite a few things today. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Bye for now.